Are these, uh, oh yeah, they are. I really hate these mics. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're going to move on to some um, questions and hopefully answers in this next section. And are you ready to, to roll with this straight away? Uh, yep. yep. Brilliant, okay. All right, well the first question is from uh, a Mr. James Christie. And the question is, the Scottish nationalists are fighting tooth and nail for what they call independence. However, they appear to be at least totally determined to remain an integral part of the European Union. I find myself utterly unable to resolve this colossal contradiction. Um, do you have any comment to make on the on this fact in of the, the this face, sorry, of British politics? Well, James, the um, the Scottish National Party um, are lots of things, um, one of which is incredibly nasty. Um, and no, I mean it. I mean pursuing really unpleasant bully boy tactics in that referendum. Um, if my supporters behaved anything like their supporters, you know, I would be condemned as being one of the most awful people that had ever lived. But they're also, James, utterly contradictory. They say they want to be an independent country inside the European Union. You cannot be an independent, self-governing nation and a member of a union whose law is supreme over yours. They've been selling the Scottish people a complete lie on this issue for decades. And I hope this referendum north of the border exposes the Scottish Nationalist Party for what they are. They are a party of European regionalists. Thank you. And the, the next question um, is from Tom Hollins. And he's talking about the protesters outside who are actually calling us racist. What... <laughs> <coughs> what more can we do and to get rid of, of this label? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the protesters outside can call us that. Did anyone see what John McDonnell called UKIP the other day? Evil. Evil. Well, you've heard what we've had to say today. If you think we're evil, that's fine. Uh, Mr. McDonnell, of course, who spent most of his career snuggling up to Martin McGuinness, Jerry Adams, and the IRA. <laughs> you know what? That's what I call evil. That's what I call evil. Not standing up, not standing up for the interests of this country and of those people outside. It's a shame, really. It'd be rather better if they came in and sat and listened and asked questions. Because I'd welcome them. I'd welcome them. And, and honestly, all of these meetings are genuine public meetings. We're not frightened of meeting the public. You know, if you've come along tonight, because you support us, that's terrific. If you've come along tonight because you're open-minded, that's terrific. If you've come along tonight to remove any last suspicion about how much you dislike me, you're still very welcome uh, to come along this evening. Um, but what those people out there are doing is that they are reflecting what I talked about earlier. They are reflecting the way that our political class try to close down intelligent debate on proper issues by throwing out abuse. And that is what they represent, and that is not the future. It is not the future. It is not what the people of this country want. We want to have, we want to have a proper, honest debate in this country. And I would also point out uh, to our friends outside uh, that within UKIP, we have people of every race, of every religion, and they're here, and they're British, and they want us to be a united society and an independent country. Thank you, Nigel. Um, on these questions, it doesn't actually say who they're directed to, so feel free to jump in, Mike, if you want to. <laughs> now, the last right. one upset me so much, I had to answer. <laughs> Do you think... Um, this question is from, actually, I can't read the signature, but do you think the result of the 2016 council elections will affect the date of the referendum? Um, well, look, there are, in 2016, on May the 5th next year, we've got elections to the London Assembly, I'm a London Mayor, we've got elections to the Welsh Assembly, we've got elections to the Northern Irish Assembly, 
We've got elections to the Scottish Parliament. We've also got about 1,800 seats in England for local council, many in this part of the world, being contested. We've also got police and crime commissioner elections being contested. So May the 5th electorally is a huge day. Um, and the referendum folks will not be on May the 5th because the Electoral Commission actually quite sensibly say you shouldn't confuse a whole raft of domestic elections with a national referendum. Um, now, if parties like ours do well in those elections, ahead of a referendum that might happen as early as June, perhaps it'll be later, perhaps it'll be October, who knows, uh, the better we do, the better we do in all of those elections, indeed you could argue the better we do this Thursday over the slightly, over the slightly wetter side of the Pennines. It's, um, I'd say, Yorkshire is virtually a desert compared with Lancashire, isn't it? Um, and, and the better we do in all of these elections, uh, the, more it wakes the, you know, the more it wakes voters up to the fact that there are serious issues here that are making people change their votes. So, yeah, that's true. But I'm going to just say this, that when it comes to this referendum, what we have got to do, and what all the other groups involved have got to do, is we've got to put aside any traditional political tribal differences we may have had in the past. This referendum isn't about being right-wing or left-wing or centrist. None of that matters. This referendum is about getting our country back and I will work with anybody and everybody to try and make that happen. The, the next question is from a E. Jackson. And it is, if we did not have to pay the EU, how much money would we have to spend on the National Health Service, the police, and other important issues and services? Quite a lot, I think. Well, I mean, look, where we are at the moment is we pay a gross fee of about £55 million a day, and we get back some of that, so it's a net fee of £30 million a day. We spend about the same on foreign aid every single day, and over the lifetime of this Parliament, you know that Osborne's cutting all these budgets? Let me tell you what he's not cutting. He's not cutting the foreign aid budget, which next year will be bigger than the police budget in this country, which strikes me as being a wrong, completely wrong sense of priorities. No, I agree, I know, absolutely. Um, so by the end of this Parliament, we'll be spending 100 million quid a day on EU contributions and foreign aid. And I tell you what, I tell you what, you can build a new district hospital for £200 million. Give you some idea of how much better we could spend our own money in this country. Right, um, there's not a name on this one, uh, but it says if we are at war with ISIS and are killing dangerous so-called British jihadis overseas, why um, are we allowing them back into this country? Uh, um, uh, I'll answer it anyway. If you want to answer it, you can. Well, no, no, no. no. You don't even finish the question. I'm, I'm so upset already, I want to answer it. The, so, the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary want to take away the passports of people who might leave this country to go and fight in Syria. Whilst at the same time, we now have 450 people living freely on our streets who've taken part in that war in Syria and been brutalized by that process. I don't want to take away the passports of those that wish to leave. If that's where they want to go, I'm very pleased to see the back of them. And, and as far as those returning from fighting for ISIS in Syria, I would take their passports away and never let them back into the country. And, and I said this last week and I was, I was condemned by the Labour Party for saying it. We don't want people like that back in Britain. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> 
And we've got another question here from Rob McRobbie, I think it says. Scottish, Scottish National Party. Mm. <laughs> Um, when we win this referendum, what is the process of leaving the EU and how long will it take? Well, we are bound by a current treaty obligation to enter into a phased withdrawal from the European Union, a series of negotiations that could last for up to two years. I don't want this to last for up to two years, but I do want us to leave the European Union amicably to do it sensibly and to be able to tie up as many loose ends as possible. And if the price of getting back the independence and self-government and control of our nation back is a few months of grown-up, mature negotiation in Brussels, those few months, in my view, would be very well spent. And again, Nigel, unfortunately, this question is addressed to you. Um, <coughs> What is your message to those of us who are long-term established EU citizens living and working in the UK? How would you convince us that leaving the EU will be good for us? Or do you suggest this group of people return to their own country of origin? And this is from Ursula from Leeds. Well, Ursula, there are EU citizens living and working in Britain. And, of course, there are British citizens living and working in the EU. And there always have been. In fact, before the First World War, you could travel to Europe and live there without even needing a passport. So, so this is not some brand new invention. The problem, Ursula, is this, that for every one British person that works in the EU, there are now between four and five EU people working in Britain. And we need to get some degree of control over that. Let me be clear. Anybody that has come to Britain legally is able to stay in Britain legally, of course. Of course. But I do want us to move, I do want us to move post this referendum to a different system where if somebody from Poland who's got skills to bring wants to come and work in Britain, that's fine. But they don't qualify for tax credits. They don't qualify for free health insurance. And they have to, and they have to show us whether they have a criminal record or not. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing unusual about this. There are 200 other countries in the world who, if any of you in this room wanted to go and live there or wanted to go and work there, you would need to bring your own health cover and prove you weren't a dangerous criminal. I want Britain to be a normal country that controls who comes in. Um, this question is from um, Colin Walshaw, and he's a UKIP member of six years, and Nigel what do you think the outcome of the global warming conference will be and how powerful is the, the Dwyer's lobby? The global warming conference in Paris, what will come out of it? An awful lot of hot air. And we, I am not standing here and saying to you that we should be irresponsible about our planet. But I am standing here saying to you we should not listen to some of the alarmism. You know, 25 years ago, 25 years ago, we were told that unless we acted quickly, you know, the whole world would end. It would be a terrible catastrophe. Uh, Prince Charles came to the European Parliament eight years ago and told us that within seven years, the entire North Pole would have disappeared. It would have melted. So there's been an awful lot of alarmism on this. Look, let me just say this. Whether we like it or not, you simply cannot say to countries like India and China that they should not be allowed to develop, to modernise and westernise and have fridges and motor cars and the standard of living that we've got. You simply cannot say that to human beings who want to advance. And the price of that, the price of that is they now have to produce significant amounts of electricity. And they produce that electricity by burning coal on a scale that we simply can't imagine. What upsets me is that we, as a country that produces less than 2% of global CO2 emissions, have in line with some European agreements 
but, but, but added on to that some unilateral ideas from this government, and we have now priced manufacturing industry out of much of the north of England. That production has been transferred to India. There is no zero, there is no reduction of CO2 emissions, and yet we've beggared ourselves to try and show the world how virtuous we are, whilst knowing that India and China will never, ever do it. And I, as I say, I think we should be concerned about pollution. We should be concerned about the world we live in. I suspect we're rather too obsessed with carbon dioxide, and I want to reduce energy costs in Britain. I want to stop subsidising wind farms, paying rich landowners a whole load of money for you and our businesses to pay the bill. And I think this is our, our last question, actually. Okay. And um, it's, uh, it's quite a, an odd one. It is, who is the candidate standing at Oldham this Thursday? Because I'd like to put £100 on him to win. Uh, well, yeah, the candidate standing at Oldham for us is a guy called John Bickley. I was in Oldham today. Uh, as I said, a very wet Oldham today. Um, look, this is a very safe this, by the way, is a non-referendum question, I think, really. But uh, this is a very safe Labour seat. Great big majority of 15,000 at the last election. Uh, this shouldn't even be a contest. It shouldn't even be a ripple, you know, in the national newspapers in terms of debate. But it is, and why? Because the issues that we've talked about, the issues of border control, the issues of, of irresponsible open-door migration, the issues of security, these things are now much more salient in people's minds. But there's another reason why it's actually going to be very close between us and Labour on Thursday, despite the fact they've had this safe seat for all these decades. And it's simply this. Traditional Labour voters in the north of England look at Jeremy Corbyn, look at the fact that he wants to get rid of the Queen, look at the fact that he cozied up to the IRA, look at the fact that he is, is somewhat sympathetic to Hamas and his Hezbollah, and look at the fact that when he was asked the question, if there's a Kalashnikov toting terrorist in a shopping centre, should the police shoot to kill, he hesitated. So people are saying, this guy is not patriotic, and this country would not be safe under this guy, and about half the people who voted Labour on May the 7th this year are appalled by Corbyn's leadership. All right, that's where we are. I... So it's going to be a close contest. I will say a word for one of the other political parties that's standing. Uh, my old friend Alan Hope, who was the leader of the official Monster Raving Looney Party, um, and he is, um, they are contesting the Oldham by-election with one policy. The policy is we should keep the Falkland Islands, but give Jeremy Corbyn to Argentina. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, for sitting and listening to us tonight. I hope we've given you some information that you're going to take away and be better informed when you make your vote in the referendum. And I do hope that we've convinced you that we are better off out of the EU and into the world. I'd, I'd like to just thank our speakers tonight, Mike Hookham, and uh, obviously, last but not least, Nigel Farage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Brilliant.